In this video, we're going to be talking about the La Nina blooming for fall and winter, the difference between a La Nina and an El Nino, plus my early thoughts on the winter ahead. So if you're new to the channel, click the subscribe button and notification bell to get all my daily updates to keep you ahead of the storm. So let's get right to it. Uh, we are currently in a La Nina watch. We've been presently in an Enzo neutral conditions, but going forward, uh, we're gonna be starting to look at below average conditions across the Pacific Ocean and the equatorial sea surface temperatures as we make a transition from an Enzo neutral to a La Nina, which is more favored as we go deeper into fall and winter. In fact, almost a 70 to an 80% chance we're going to be in a La Nina type conditions as we go into the winter of 2021-2022. Uh, here's a chart where we are currently right now. We're in an Enzo neutral, which is predominantly uh, negative 0.5 to a positive 0.5. Here's graphically the blue is your La Nina. The gray is your uh, your neutral conditions, and then your red is your El Nino. We are currently in an Enzo neutral. We're making a transition into a La Nina as we right now currently in September. This is September, October, November. As we go deeper into fall, we now have an 80% chance we're transferring into a weak La Nina, and it stays there as we go into the heart of the winter months, December, January, and February. And then as we get out of winter, going into the spring of 2022, we make a transition back to an Enzo neutral. And then we pr predominantly stay in that Enzo neutral as we go deeper into spring of next year. So here's the chart where we are currently right now. Notice that the Enzo neutral is between a positive five and a negative 0.5. Notice the trend as we've been trending since July, currently until September 28th, that the downward trajectory, we're literally right there on borderline on the cusp of a negative 0.5. That's borderline weak La Nina conditions. And then we're going to be transferring into classifying, going into a weak La Nina as we get deeper into October and especially uh, the winter months. Now, what is typically, what does a normal La Nina look like? Uh, here's your overall normal conditions, which we are currently right now in an Enzo neutral. But as we transition into that La Nina type pattern, we start to see cooler waters out here into the equatorial Pacific. We have increased trade winds that come across. We typically see the Pacific start to shut down. We have a less active time in the hurricane season. Uh, we have a, a more active time on the Atlantic side, which is what we've actually been seeing. We're, we start to see cooler conditions start to enter back into the Pacific Northwest, as well as wetter conditions also coming back. And that's what we typically have started to see the beginning effects of that currently. That is the beginning stages of a La Nina. So as we transition into an El Nino, it's basically the opposite. We have a lot warmer waters into the equatorial Pacific. The southern jet stream is a lot more active. You typically get a lot of wetter and uh, wet, you know, it's very wet. And, and the southern subtropical jet, uh, you, the polar jet is a li little bit less active during those times. And typically you would have warmer conditions filtering in into much of the, the US. So as we transition into the temperatures currently right now for the sea surface temperatures, this is where we at. As we're continuing to deepen into a La Nina, check out all the cooler waters into the equatorial Pacific. So as this Southern jet becomes less active, it's less susceptible to pick up some of the colder waters because storms like warmer waters, right? and to would dump it over the southern regions, you start to see the polar jet a lot more active. It's picking up on these warmer sea surface temperatures out here and dumps heavier rains. And eventually when it gets cold enough, it snows into uh, the heart of the US. And then look what happens out here into the 
uh, as far as the Atlantic and the Caribbean, we still have October to deal with. Look at all the warm conditions as we're transferring into a weak La Nina. We have less shear that's going to be happening over the, the Caribbean. And we'll look at all the warmer ocean sea surface temperatures, not just in the Caribbean and the Gulf, but especially up here along the East Coast as well. So here's where we are currently right now. This is the difference between the subtropical jet and the polar jet. Remember, right now we're in a weak La Nina. This solar, uh, this subtropical jet becomes less active. So you, st you tend to see start start to drying out a lot of the conditions down here in the, into the parts of the south, this polar jet becomes more active. It starts to take advantage of this warm blob out here, picks up some of that, dumps heavy, dumps rains over the Pacific. And then when it gets cold enough, this polar jet starts to buckle. And as it buckles, it allows the colder air to filter into the United States, but it also allows the snow to filter into the United States with this warm blob it's able to pick up out here uh, that's currently that's going to be, gonna be uh, intensifying the snowstorms as we go into the heart of a winter. So let's take a look at another factor, which is your Southern Oscillation Index. Now this plays off the subtropical jet, right? And so typically when you, this is a, an indications where you can see El Nino and La Nina type uh, conditions in the Pacific Ocean. Now, typically when it's a negative eight, that, uh, that indicates an El Nino, more wetter time, time, time frame, right? That's not what we've been seeing. It's been predominantly in the positive range. Here lately, it's been somewhat neutral. That's what we're currently in right now. But look at the 90 day, look at the 30 day moving average. That is a positive nine, which is the opposite. So that would be a positive seven. So right now we're a nine. So that indicates we're in going, we're in a La Nina, not just the 30 day, but also the 90 day moving average. So that's another indication. And then you look at these little daily drops of a positive 36. That's a lot of dry, dry weather, right? But it's also interesting if you look at the daily conditions, you can also pick out when you might have a little bit wetter type uh, pattern coming up. So here's the daily drops in the last 30 days. You can see most of them have been predominantly positive and that's the trend that we're going into. And that's why we've been really dry in the Southern regions for September because we're going in predominantly a, a more below average type atmosphere as far as precipitation goes. But notice the indications that happened about five days ago out here in the SOI index where we had a sudden drop. It dropped to a negative 10, right? It indicates an El Nino. So sometimes you can actually pick up on little subtle hints when you might have a wetter time frame for the South going forward. So this hinted a couple days ago, five days ago, that, hey, when this dropped to negative 10 and it stayed there for several days, that indicated, because this is a lagging indicator, that we could be looking at more wetter type conditions coming up, going uh, forward into uh, parts of the south, but only happened for a short time frame, because look what happens, you know, it had five consecutive drops, but then it goes back positive. So that is indicating on this lagging indicator, say, hey, we could be looking at a wetter time frame, and that's exactly what we're seeing. So here's the here's the overall outlook as far as the Pacific storms. Uh, when we were in into an Enzo neutral, you can definitely see it was a more active time frame in the, the Pacific, especially as we got into August. It wasn't nearly as active now on the Atlantic side. But now that we're transferring into more of a weak La Nina, did the trade winds increase in the Pacific? So you have a less active time frame. You have more shear in the, in the Pacific. And that's why they only had one named storm in all the entire month of September. Now that we got into a little bit favoring more of a weak La Nina, that's why we had less shear in the Atlantic side now. And we have eight name storms in September. And we're probably looking at Victor and Wanda this week out here out in the Atlantic. And then we'll look at the Caribbean 
uh, for October, because with the week La Nina coming on, I'm expecting a, 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 an active October ahead on the hurricane front. So now let's take a look at the last 30 days, right? The last 30 days, you saw the trend in the SOI index going into a weak La Nina, which favored the overall drier conditions hinting for parts of the South. And that's typically what we've been seeing from August 28th to September 28th, right? But it also indicated that the weak La Nina was developing and enhanced the polar jet, taking advantage of that warm blob and out, out there in the Pacific, right? That's why we're starting to see these above average rains coming back for the Pacific Northwest. And that's the trend that we're gonna be seeing uh, going forward. But notice the, the blip that I showed you in the SOI index, that was a leading indicator to say, hey, we could be having a period of above average rainfall uh, looking ahead for parts of the South. And that was a leading indicator in the SOI. And look what's happening over the next 10 days for a good chunk of the Southwest and to Texas for parts of the South, above average rainfalls, right? And we're still getting the above average rainfall in the Pacific Northwest. So this is definitely the development of that weak La Nina starting to develop, right? And here's that subtle dip in the SOI index, the hint at the above average rainfall, but only for maybe a short amount of time for parts of the South. And then you're trending to more of a, a lesser, you know, below average rainfall. You got to remember October is your second wettest month for parts of the South. So it's not out of the ordinary that you start to see some heavier rains as we go into uh, October. So here's interesting going forward. Here's the setup for this week from September, tw uh, September 28th through October the 5th. We've got that ridge that we've been talking about that's pr primarily uh, positive over Canada and I think that continues that brings the if not record high temperatures for parts of the the, the north today uh, but then you have that troughing on the outside that's bringing the below average temperature swinging underneath and I think this trend just continues as we go deeper into October the ridge stays there locked in loaded intensifies the positive over Canada as the positive stays connected over Canada, that typically causes divergence underneath. And as conditions become a little bit more favorable in the Caribbean, that's gonna help lower the pressures underneath in the Caribbean. And that's when we're gonna see an above average time frame going into October. That's looking at on the, uh, the volatility index, because look at this. Uh, this is an early indication as we go into October. There's October the 6th time frame with that ridge, that positive over, uh, over uh, Southeast Canada. That's going to help lower the pressures underneath. And we have a lot of vertical uplift in the, uh, in the Caribbean. Look at the placement as we go into that second week of October. And it stays that way all the way through October 23rd. So we have a lot of upward rising motion air happening in the Caribbean. We got above average temperatures uh, over uh, Southeast Canada, over the Northern interiors of the United States. That was able to cause the, the, the convergence underneath. And that's why I'm expecting a, a, above average uh, hurricane to continue uh, in October. As, as we go deeper into October, that ridge just stays locked and loaded over, over the Southeast Canada, troughing on the West. So I'm definitely expecting the cooler conditions to continue for the Pacific Northwest. And then the, some of the below average temperatures are able to filter in on the backside off the uh, West Coast. I'll show you the trend going forward. Now, typically when you have a positive over Canada, you cause the divergence underneath. Yes, I'm expecting a very active uh, uh, Caribbean. Now, this would be your typical origin of the track of where these would go when they do develop. And it's more likely that we would trend bit more favorable in these red shaded cones into the Caribbean, into Florida. And then up the East Coast, I showed you the sea surface temperatures out there in the Atlantic. So there's plenty of warm water to contend with. 
and with the setup over the top yes i'm definitely expecting a more active time frame in the caribbean now you see texas is somewhat in the clear typically you get uh after the first fall front of the year with these fronts coming in that puts typically texas out of play and it puts more of the southeast but primarily the caribbean florida and up the east coast a little bit more favorable track for tropical development or you know movement and as we go deeper into october so here's some of the october anomalies that i'm looking at with the deepening ridge the positive polar vortex or the really strong polar vortex keeps uh the, the a lot of the colder air well to the north and you have ridging underneath that's going to bring the above average temperatures over parts of the ohio valley into the northeast we have the cooler weather coming back the above average rains coming back for the pacific northwest and prim primarily with the ridging over here and the troughing out west we're going to stay somewhat below average uh, overall for parts of the west as we as we as we enter october then as we enter november i'm thinking this ridge will start to continue to lift further and further north as this ridge continues to lift further and further north that's going to allow the polar jet underneath to release some of that colder air into canada and we're going to start to see colder shots you have the you have the hurricane season uh tr somewhat dying down by then it's a lot less active in the hurricane front for november as the polar jet continues to get more active as we get deeper into that weak la nina we're going to be allowed to have coal shots entering the united states and that's when we could start seeing some of our colder temperatures start to filter in uh subtle temperatures but start to filter into the midsection of the country go into the ohio valley and then as the ridge would lift up to the north we'll, we'll start to see colder conditions start to filter in at times for parts of the uh, of the ohio valley the mid-atlantic and the northeast as we start to see some of those warmer conditions with that weak la nina or the south and the southeast but as we transition into december i do feel the ridge is going to continue the lift further and further north over Greenland, that's gonna cause the Greenland blocking, that's gonna set the stage for our early winter that I think we're gonna have, uh, especially as we get into December, we'll have the polar jet really active, that'll allow it to buckle, that'll allow the colder air to filter in, and with the La Nina conditions uh, into play, we're gonna have, uh, you know, that, that negative NAO, the negative AO, and I do feel we're gonna have a colder December than we've typically seen in a while for uh, the United States. So I appreciate you guys uh, watching. Do like this video, definitely leave your comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel, catch the latest update, where I protect you before and after the storm.